first speaker today, so happy to have him, uh, Rob McEwen. He was the founder and uh, CEO of Gold Corp, which is one of the largest mining companies before it was picked up by uh, Newmont this year. Rob is now the uh, founder and head of McEwen Mining. So he doesn't really need any introduction. Rob, thank you so much for coming down. Platform is all yours. Thank you, Colin. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to cover a couple of topics in my talk. Um, just contributions mining has allowed my wife and I to make to society. Why uh, I think the future for gold looks good. Uh, talk about gold equities, some of the practices the industry uses to destroy value. Um, a bit about McEwen mining and then uh, I call it a mining rant that's being distributed that I think everybody should uh, work to fix. This is, um, my wife and I have given away about $70 million to uh, basically health care, education. Um, in the upper left, it, it just says McEwen Atrium. That's in the, the largest research hospital in Canada and where we set up a research center for regenerative medicine and stem cell research. We funded it back in 2003. We saw a crisis in the healthcare system and that regenerative medicine and stem cell held out the promise of profoundly changing the delivery of healthcare and addressing many of the, the diseases out there that haven't found a cure yet. Uh, we also um, support a number of educational endeavors to develop leaders and entrepreneurs and and then there's some architecture in there as well but how can and I think mining um, there are many people in the mining industry that have contributed a lot to society and that's often forgot about when people are looking at uh, mining this is a chart it's been around for a long time and it's created by taking the Dow Jones industrial average and dividing it by the price of gold and you come up with a number of ounces it takes to match gold. So right now the Dow's at about 25,800 and gold's 1280. And if you divided it, you'd have a number of about 20 ounces of gold buys the Dow. So this chart starts in 1896 over on the left. So you're looking at 123 years of history. And you see these peaks, one occurred in 1929, another in 1966, another in 1999. So those were all periods of great enthusiasm in the market where people preferred to buy growth stocks than value stocks. And they were quickly followed by sharp drops in the market. And you can see that the ratio or the number of ounces required to buy the Dow dropped down to the baseline of one or two ounces buying the Dow. So you had back in 1896, you started at one ounce bought the Dow, then again in 1932, and in 1980. And you might remember the Dow was 800 in 1980. Um, so we're going through these cycles, and we came down to about seven and we've come back up, but I would suggest to you we're going back down to one or two ounces by the Dow before this cycles out. Um, just the gold price since President Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, we've seen gold go from basically $40 an ounce to a high of 1920. Again, some cycles, and I think you're going to see it go much higher from where it is today. Uh, my number is $5,000, um, and you might say, well, how do you get that? If you look at the run from $40 to 800 from 1970 to 80, there was a 20-fold increase. Um, it's fairly simple math. You put the same thing on the base at 2000 which was $250. Uh, by 20 is $5,000. Um, this is just looking at two things. One, the national debt and it's sitting at 22 trillion dollars right now and that's the gold line that you and there are two scales on here on you have the national debt number on the left on the vertical and on the right you have the cost 
the interest cost of the national debt. So as the national debt's gone up, the cost to service it has gone down and the interest rate's been lower. But you can see that at certain times it was very expensive to finance the national debt. And those days may return. And right now, the debt is unsustainable. And it's not just here, but it's around the world. We're in this giant experiment where governments have gone out and expanded their money supply, expanded the amount of debt they have on their books, and they don't have the ability to pay back in a higher interest rate. Historically, interest rates over the last 100 years have been 5 to 6%. So if we ever return to that, there are very few ways of getting out of this dilemma. The favorite way is inflation, making the every dollar in our wallet worth less. Uh, going back just on the growth concept, this is uh, looking at the Russell 1000. They have a growth index and they also have a value index. This is a ratio of the two. Uh, where we are today is the same place we were in 1999 when the, the tech bubble blew up. Um, this is a, a bigger picture, bigger than the Russell 1000. It's a global look at value versus growth. And it's running from 2000 to today. And we're back down at a period where value stocks are definitely much, much smaller than growth stocks. It's also, in 2000, was the low for gold in the last cycle. And we're at a similar point. The next chart is just, again, looking at how everybody is thinking about growth. And when you're looking at new issues, this is running from 1990 forward. And you can see these are annual IPOs and how much, how many of these companies had no earnings before they went public. And right now, we're at a point similar to the last, to around 2000 and better than 80% of the stocks going public are making no money right now. If you look at the confidence in the marketplace, um, we're looking at the confidence of small businesses and the confidence of consumers. The small businesses are shown in black and the consumer's confidence is shown in blue. So here, the consumers are saying it's easy to find jobs small business owners saying it's not easy to find jobs. And we've seen that in our own uh, business in Nevada where we're just completing the construction of a mine. Labor was really tight. So the market's tightening up and at some point it becomes, it starts moving into inflation and you have to start wa raising wages and then you see a drop off occurring. So we're at another point where you might think it's the enthusiasm might be getting carried away. The next slide is just from the Federal Reserve and it's looking at money printing. In the upper left, you're seeing how the, the growth in the money supply was going along until 2008 when the financial crisis occurred and then they just opened up the taps and started printing money like crazy to try to buoy up the economy. Uh, the national debt went up at the same rate. Another indicator, student loans are well over a trillion dollars. These are all like four trillion, 22 trillion, greater than one trillion. And this was all to get the economy going. The impact is the bottom three graphs. Home ownership dropped off sharply. Food stamps is still quite high. And the velocity of money, which is a very important indicator of economic activity, is very low in this period from 1960. Where does it all lead to? Governments trying to get out of the situation where they have to pay their debt, they resort to debasing the currency. One of the more recent was in Zimbabwe. So it was curious, one day um, when Zimbabwe was having their problems, one of my associates came in and gave me a hundred million dollar note. 
And I went, hey, this is great. I'm a centimillionaire. And then he came back about a month later and he gave me a $1 trillion note. I said, this is getting better. Then I get a $100 trillion note to be a centitrillionaire. This is, um, this is what happens when governments take on too much debt. They debase the currency and the debt becomes unserviceable. If interest rates go up, we're going to find that it's going to take more dollars out of our wallet to buy whatever we want. And that's one of the reasons you look to gold. So let's talk about gold equities for a moment. I apologize, this is a rather busy chart, but what it's showing is over the last 77 years, there has been eight bear markets in gold stocks. And each one of these lines is tracking the decline in value. So on the, the y-axis, the vertical is how far it fell in terms of loss. And on the bottom is the duration in weeks, going out to 400, better than 400 weeks. The bright red line is the last bear market we were in. And you can see it was one of the two longest bear markets in the last 77 years. And it was also the deepest. So that's suggesting to me that the downside risk of gold equities is, at least on a historical basis, relatively small. During the same period, there's been six bull markets in gold equities. And the average gain has been 540%. Again, this, we're in the seventh, and it's shown in red. We're about 45% through the longest cycles. You can see that the big upturns at the end of the cycles, most of the move in gold stocks happen in the last half of the bull market. And in the last six months to a year, you have very strong moves up. So to me, the upside looks good. Uh, we're currently at 177, so you have a two, two and a half X from here if you were to get to the average. Some. Another way of looking at it using the Huey Gold Mining Index and looking back to 2000, there was a saucer bottom. They then went up 1,300% um, and right now, we, from a technical standpoint, it looks like we're doing a saucer bottom now. So again, low downside risk and attractive upside. Another way of just looking at it, the GDX, which is a senior gold mining ETF versus gold is on the left and you had a peak and a trough. And the difference between that if the, you went back up to the peak would be 5.8x. And then you have the GDXJ versus gold and going back to the peak would give you an 8.2x on that. Was there a time when gold was, and gold stocks were more important? Absolutely. In 1938, Homestake, which was the largest gold mining company in the country, uh, was 5% of the value of the New York Stock Exchange. It was one of the largest companies on the New York Stock Exchange. Again, in 87, it was 4.5%. This is sort of how much gold has fallen today Newmont, which is, as Colin said, just absorbed Gold Corp, has a $25 billion value. It's the only gold stock in the S&P. The S&P represents 80% of all the public money in the country, and its value relative to the aggregate S&P is 0.1%. Tiny, nothing. Right now, there is no real incentive for a portfolio manager to go out and buy a gold stock from a standpoint of impact on his portfolio. However, he's probably missing something, he or she. Gold hasn't done much. It's only up 22% since the beginning of 16. The S&P's up twice that. It's at 40. And the Dow's at 47. But if you look at the GDX, the ETF for senior golds, it's up 52%. So in the last three years, if you bought the GDX, you would have done better than the Dow. 
And that, for many people, comes as a big surprise. It's showing that gold is moving right now, and most people aren't paying attention to it. Now, within the gold mining industry, I think you have to be careful. And there's some companies out there that are very good at convincing management of gold mining companies and explorers of selling things called royalties, where they lose part of their revenue, selling metal streams, where they lose part of the metal they produce. And it's done, they come out and say, in the last five years, it's been very difficult to raise money in this sector. And the royalty companies have come along and said, well, we've got money, we'll take some of your production. Well, what they did, I'd have to say, people in the mining industry want to build mines, they want to explore, but they're not thinking a lot about the future, they're thinking about the current. And they've sold their future. They've sold the profit margin. And this graph is showing Sandstream is a metal streaming company. They take a certain percent of the stream or the production of a company's uh, annual production. Franco Nevada is a um, royalty company, a very good royalty company. And it's done very well, but they've stolen the profit margin of the industry. And this is showing part of that. You can see here, um, we've created an index of eight streamers and royalty companies against the GDX. And you can see the difference. There's better than a 20% difference in performance since the beginning of 16. And that's the industry selling its, its premium. So whenever I'm buying, looking to buy a stock, if some management team comes along and says, I'm selling a stream or a royalty, I most often turn away. And I don't want to talk to them because they're giving away the upside. And I think they're lazy in that they're not working on preserving the value. If you're an investor and you're buying a gold stock, you're buying a gold stock because you want it to run higher, not to stand still and have a, a mine built that's not doing anything. So there is some good news in the royalties. The royalties had the upper hand in the last while. They had the money. The market wasn't giving any money to the companies. But right now, we're seeing the performance of the royalty companies come down to the producers because the capital markets are coming back. And when the capital markets come back, the companies don't have to be held for a ransom by the royalty companies and the streamers. And you can see in this chart, this is again from the beginning of 16, and you have Barrick, um, its share price relative to Franco Nevada, and they're intersecting right now. You can see that Barrick, the producers outperform the streamers and the royalty companies in strong markets. In weak markets, they underperform. And we're coming into a point where there's an inflection and the, the producers and the explorers are going to do better than the streamers. A little bit about McEwen Mining. We're somewhat unique. We have very large insider ownership. Uh, production growth is about 16% this year. We have a large exploration program going on on a number of our properties. And if you don't like gold or silver, we have a large exposure to copper as a bonus. Um, safe harbor statement, if you don't like risk, I just say don't buy our stock. We have a volatile stock, and if you don't have an appetite for risk, you shouldn't be there. Illustrate volatility. Um, I built Gold Corp over 19 years, and um, I left in 2005 and thought we'd been growing at a compound annual rate at Gold Corp of better than 31% a year for more than 13 years. Uh, we'd grown from $50 million to over $8 billion market cap. And I thought, how am I going to keep up 31% a year compound annual growth rate? And I thought, the bigger the company gets, the harder it becomes. So I decided to step out of Gold Corp. When I left it, we had $400 million in cash. We had no debt. We are the lowest cost gold producer in the world. And I just bought another company called Wheaton River. And I had told my shareholders, I thought it would double or triple in 12 months 
irrespective of what the price of gold did. It tripled in 14 months. Um, I was the largest individual shareholder and I moved on and bought a little company called US Gold that traded OTC, uh, had a market cap of 8 million. The management had been around for 22 years, they wanted to leave, so I bought a third of the company. Uh, seven months later, I bought it at 36 cents. It, I said, let's get it on an, a recognized exchange, listed it on the Toronto exchange, let's put a new board in, let's start exploring. Seven months later, it was trading just under $10 a share. A little irrational exuberance. Uh, so, and, and then the financial crisis came along. We made a discovery. There was, it ran up again. But when I talked about volatility, you can see the volatility here. Um, we're listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange. Um, and uh, my investment in the company is $164 million of that. 39% um, of that, $139 million is my cost of my shares. And the other 25, we borrowed $50 million last summer. And I, I thought our share price was low and I didn't want to issue any more stock. So um, we borrowed 50 million, I put up 25 of the 50. Um, I wanted straight debt, no convertibility, no warrants, something we could pay off in three years and move on and hopefully sell shares at a later date at a higher price. I own 22% of the company, I get a dollar a year as a salary, no options, no bonus. When I, as I said earlier on, I was the largest individual shareholder of Gold Corp, and I thought I wanted to take that model a step further. I wanted to be right beside investors so that I get compensated the same way they do, through a higher share price. And that's my focus. And I think too much of the industry is taking too much off the table without, and they don't have much risk. So this is just looking at share ownership of a number of companies, uh, large and small, in the gold mining industry, and what they own of the company. Um, in terms of what they've taken off the table, Paulson came out and made a lot of complaints. Big hedge fund in New York in the gold space. Um, they looked at a number of CEOs and of this group of 13, there was um, they took just under $700 million out since 2010 in compensation. Um, I get a dollar a year. In that same period, I took $3. Um, so let's talk about McEwen Mining. It, daily volume is just under 3 million shares. There's 360 million shares outstanding. Uh, not a lot of options. 374 million outstanding fully diluted. Our share price, we've been beaten up lately. Uh, market cap, 500 million. And according to Bloomberg, one of the highest betas in the industry, uh, better than three. And you can see the uh, pie chart showing the ownership. We have a diversified portfolio of properties spread between Canada, the United States, Mexico, and Argentina. Gold, silver, copper exposure. Two of our properties, the one in uh, Timmins, which Canada, and in Nevada, which we're just building. There are a couple of exploration targets that I want to talk about. In the upper and lower chart, the red is showing ore bodies. The black vertical lines are mine shafts. And then there's some horizontal lines showing 1,000 meters and 2,000 meters. 1,000 meters, um, 3,750 feet. Um, below surface. And this is really just showing the depth, how deep these ore bodies have gone. So Red Lake is where Gold Corp had its key mine, and it's down below 2,000 meters right now. Timmins has been going for more than 100 years, and the mines are between um, a kilometer and a half and a kilometer and three quarters. Kirkland Lake, which has been a great story. It's down to 2,000 meters. We bought a property in Timmins called Black Fox. Uh, the previous owners had purchased it 2014. They bought it for 
the company that owned it, they paid $300 million to buy it. They have assumed $140 million of debt when they made that purchase. They put $120 million into it. And so they're into it for $560 million, and we bought it three years after they bought it for $35 million. Um, we looked at it and we said, there are a couple of areas we like about it. One, it has, it's over on the far right, and you see the little red dots. It doesn't go as deep as the others. So we thought there was depth extension there. We also, um, so that's Timmins, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And on the bottom in Nevada, there's deposit, the Carlin-style Carlin deposits are the hosts of very large gold deposits. Barrick was really the first one to get into that in Nevada. Um, but so gold strike is shown here. The blue is denoting oxide ore, which is usually processed through a heap leach, and it's shallow, close to surface. And the red is sulfide ore that needs another type of processing, but it's richer more frequently. And again, it's showing depth of these deposits of gold strike on the Carlin Tran Cortez Hills is another, it's Barrick's largest gold mine in the world. And it's also deeper. It happens to be located 25 miles from our Nevada property on the same fault structure. And we're going after both expanding the oxides, the blue, but also looking for the red. So I'm going to take you to Timmins. The mine is called Black Fox. Um, it's a busy diagram, I apologize. The upper gray area is what was mined by Open Pit, and then you have a zigzagging line coming down on the right, and those are ramps to access the underground mine. All of the values shown in red are what was drilling we did last year. We spent $19 million exploring here. Now this is a mine when we bought it was producing five gram material. So not particularly rich. And it had gone, it had ramped up to 100,000 ounces a year when the previous owner bought it. And then it dropped to 50 when we bought it. Short life and higher cost. And we looked at it and said, well, maybe we could bring down the cost, but we really should be exploring it. And so we found, as you can see in here, the reds are the numbers like in the very top saying 25.5 GT is grams per ton, AU is gold, and then the distance is um, 3.35 meters, or meters just over three feet. And you can see these grades, they're quite attractive. They're double digit, they're a couple of triple digit grams per ton. And it always struck me as rather odd that we're, the mine is only recovering five grams. I want to give you a, <laughs> about a month and a half ago, we had uh, a fire at this mine on surface in the, the crusher. And I'd always been curious about why we're not getting more gold out of the ground. And I went over and I looked where they were crushing the ore and there was a lot of fine material, very small material. And I got talking to one of our geos and it said, this, this structure, this crushing structure was open to the elements, it's three stories high, the wind would blow through and there was a lot of dust. So he said, he went and sampled the dust that was in the snow, to see if it had any gold in it. And the sample he brought back contained four grams of gold. And I said, this is in the snow, and we're only recovering four grams from this mine. And it, in looking at it closer, they were taking the ore and crushing it very small, then putting it in a truck and driving it 40 kilometers away or 25 miles away to a process plant that we have. So he didn't sample in just one place. He sampled in 10 places around the property and the, the dust was running 
two to six grams. And I thought, now this crusher had been in place since 2011, and two different owners before us had been crushing to that size. And it struck me that when I look at the grades that were intersecting here, and I look at the grades we're recovering, that they weren't paying attention to how they were mining their gold. I mentioned Gold Corp earlier on. It was a very rich mine. And whenever we went into an area, our miners went into an area, we would, and blast, we would wash down all the walls and the, and the ceiling. We'd go in with a vacuum cleaner and suck up everything because there was so much gold that gold's very fine and falls down to the bottom. Um, and if you don't pay attention to it, you lose it. So one of the things I thought in here, one, we have a lot of high grade. It's nuggety, so we have to be careful with it. So we've expanded the crusher and we're getting rid of the contractor, the size that the crusher produces reduces the rock to. But right now, or at that time, they were reducing the rock by 97% in size. The weighted average size was 13 inches, and it was taking it down to minus 3 eighths of an inch. So I think we're going to see much better numbers here. Um, the property itself uh, has a number of deposits on it. In the upper center is where the mine is, Black Fox. There's a um, just under 500,000 ounces. I mentioned metal streams. I don't like them. When we bought this property, there was an 8% metal stream on it. There still is. Um, so we're exploring where there aren't any metal streams. In the bottom half of the property, there are no metal streams. And that's where we're putting our energy, because that's 8% of our revenue that we can recoup. Um, I'll go to Nevada. This chart, the diagram, the large red circle in the center is Barracks Cortez Hills complex. It's also the site of their most recent discoveries, Four Mile and um, Gold Rush. 50 million ounces in reserves they've identified here. The black dash line is a fault that is thought to be a structural control for the mineralization. 25 miles below, colored in the gold shape with the stars our gold bar mine that will be coming into per commercial production this quarter. We liked it because of the proximity to Barrick. Um, it's in similar rock. It's got intrusives. The setup's there. We hired a number of geologists from Newmont and Barrick last year, and they said, well, why aren't you drilling deeper? And we said, well, it's a heap leach mine processing oxide ores and we don't have the facilities to process sulfide. He said, well, based on our work, there's the host rock, there's a chance it's coming closer to surface. So this year, not only are we drilling to expand the surface, but we're going to be in late summer testing to see if the richer sulfide ores exist below. And why is it, for us it's interesting, and this is for a couple of reasons. This table uh, was put together by a, a Barrick, a senior geologist at Barrick back five years ago, five, six years ago. And he was curious about what was the, if you found a deposit that was greater than three million ounces, what was the chances it could grow to um, greater than 10 million? And so I'll take, try to take you through this. Over on the left, it has deposit type. So greenstone, porphyry coppers, epithermals. Um, you go to, second from the bottom is carland. And there's a comment on the, the extreme left about the abundance of these styles of deposits in the world. And then they're trying to put a percentage probability on being able to go from three to 10 million ounces. So on Carland, which is the second from the bottom, they're not that abundant. They're not, they're found in Nevada, they find them in a couple of other places in the world, but they're not that common. But if you get to 3 million ounces, the probability of getting to 10 
is 45%. It's almost a coin toss. So it's, and Nevada, if you were to look at it as, rather than a state as a country, and compare its gold production to the rest of the world, it would be the fifth largest gold producer in the world. And Nevada provides more than 80% of all the gold produced in this country. So we're looking at this. So a little more explanation. On the right hand of the chart in the shaded area, it, our deposit, so a greenstone style deposit is black fox, which is Timmins, and stock, which is also Timmins. Porphyry copper, gold, copper is CU, gold is AU, um, is our copper project in Argentina. Um, epithermal is our gold and silver mine in Argentina and our gold mine in Mexico. And Carland is our, our black fox, our gold bar property in Nevada. And we also have another property in between Barrick and ourselves uh, and Gold Bar in Nevada. Another thing about from this report was that the discovery year is, is shown on the bottom on the right, the upper right chart. The blue line is suggesting how deep the deposits are going on the y-axis on that upper chart is depth in meters where the deposits are being found. The yellow spheres are showing the size of the deposits and the ones in orange are showing what Barrick has been finding. Over right on the extreme right is a label four mile and it's their latest discovery it's down below 700 meters, and below it is one of the core, drill core samples they brought up. And you can see this is quite rich. It's 71 grams over 16 meters. That's the type of target we're looking for right now. Whether we get it or not is another question, but we've modeled it, and so we're looking both for the depth and for the surface. I'll just take a look. Um, in Argentina, there's a mine um, which we own 49% of. One of our directors discovered the property and it was in another company. Um, and he had to sell 51% to the firm that's now our partner. Uh, it's called the San Jose Mine. It's been going since 2007. It's one of the richer underground gold silver mines in the Americas. It, the property package is shown in gold, and it surrounds Gold Corp's largest mine, their Sara Negro mine. Um, gold Corp paid 3.4 billion for that property in 2010. They put 1.7 billion in to develop it. I'll have to say, they bought it after I was, had left. Um, and then they wrote it down by three billion in the last couple of years. Um, it'll do about 500,000 ounces of gold a year. It might be something, with Newmont now owning Gold Corp, every mining company wants to get bigger mines in the same area so you can spread your overhead. Um, we have had conversations. I tried to buy the other 51% but didn't have enough money in my pocket and Gold Corp tried it once and they didn't have enough either. But our partner didn't want to sell. Anyhow, in the little rectangle above it on the right is some of the grades. They've been drilling close to the mine and uh, finding more results there. I'll just talk about our copper briefly. It, to me, it's one of our wild cards. If you were to look at the mineral, mineral inventory, it's about 30 billion pounds of copper. And so, and you can see on the left some of the drill intercepts, 221 meters of 1.6% uh, copper. These are highlights, we have much lower, but, um, or down at the bottom, 429 meters, uh, 0.75 copper. These are good grades. It has small amounts of gold and silver, 5.5 million ounces of gold, 
190 million ounces of silver. So um, we did a, a preliminary economic assessment in 2017 utilizing a $3 copper price, seeing what the economics were like. Initial capital is much bigger than our market cap, so we're looking for a joint venture partner. But 2.4 billion, um, that would, at $3 copper, it's modeled to pay back in under four years, and the mine would run for 36. Um, an after-tax IRR, better than 20, and using an 8% discount rate, 2.2 uh, billion NPV value. In the first 13 years of production, it's modeled to be producing 415 million pounds of copper a year at a cost of $1.14 a pound. If you bear with me for a moment and allow me to do some alchemy and convert this copper and silver to gold and express the deposit size as a gold, this would be better than a 50 million ounce gold deposit. It would be producing on these projections, just under a million ounces a year of gold equivalent at a cost of about $550 an ounce. Um, had, if this property were in production, just to give you a sense of scale, had it been in production in 2017, it would have been the 26th largest copper deposit in the world, and it would be in the lowest quartile of the cost curve of the industry. So what's McEwen mining worth? There's, we're not covered by a lot of analysts, about four. Um, the values range from 1.6 billion to 400 million. The average is 800 right now, and we're trading at 500. Um, now, for the mining rant. Um, I grew up in the investment industry and spent my first 18 years working, doing portfolio analysis, uh, research, institutional retail sales, investment banking, and ran a couple of closed-end funds. And then one day, I was, I'd met a number of prospectors, and they kept finding deposits. And I said, you know, there are more deposits to be found. And I'd like to step out of the investment industry into the mining industry. And I thought the, pos the probability of finding a big deposit was really small, but the possibility of finding one nevertheless existed. So I wanted to see if I could get into the jet stream and um, took over a number of companies, put them all together over eight years and created Gold Corp. And that was a good run. And there's been a couple of other stories like that. So I thought the mining industry is a good place. It can give you capital that you can give back to society. You can create a lot of employment, spread the wealth around a lot of communities. But looking at the capital markets today, there's something really wrong with them. We have regulators and accounting people that insist we produce documents that you can't understand. You have, when I started in the investment industry, the Sur Securities Act was about this thick. And here and in Canada, it was about that thick. Now, it's two volumes. And I defy anybody to say they know all the rules, let alone understand them. And this, to me, is creating an environment for the criminally inspired. Because we cannot call someone off the field if they're offside. Or they've been a penalty. We don't have a common knowledge anymore of what is right. We have our sense of values. But our legal system does not allow us to do it quickly. And you think of trust. It's missing in the market. We have all these rules, and it's suggesting to the world that the people running public companies are crooks, when in fact there are some, but the vast majority are not. But the way we've allowed the securities regulators, 
the security lawyers, the accounting firms, to come out and create more and more rules to confuse. It's, it's not full, plain, clear disclosure anymore. It's full disclosure, but it's not clear and it's not plain. And I think it, everybody in this room, whether you're running, involved in running a public company, you're an investor, we should be going out and pushing back against these regulations. And I almost feel we have to call on God and say, well, will you go talk to Moses and this time give him ten commandments for the financial industry that all of us can understand and that when someone is offside, we can call them out? And that's what this mining rant is about, is to try to spur people on to say, enough is enough. We've got to have better controls. Um, the corporate governance, well intended, but it's very cumbersome. It's allowed salaries to go through the roof because you say, well, pick five peers. Okay, I've got that. But it doesn't address results. So that's my rant. I'm open for questions. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?